a certain kind I'll blow hot and cold Get down my throat yeah. You know I can't explain Hey guys, in this video we're going to show you how to make good quality demo recordings of your band in a rehearsal studio on a super low budget. Now I'm assuming you already own a laptop running a copy of Logic or Pro Tools or Cubase or whatever and then we're going to need all this additional equipment. Obviously any of these items you already own could be knocked off the list saving you money. So sure, we're going to need a USB audio interface featuring eight mic preamps. I went for the M Audio M Track 8 because it's a good low street price and it features two independent headphone outputs. Then we need a pair of active monitors. I went for a pair of KRK Rocket 5s. Then we're going to need a cheap set of Chinese drum mics, such as this set here, costing 100 euros. In a drum mic set like this, you get a kick drum mic, four general purpose dynamic mics that can be used on drums or guitar cabinets, etc. And you also get a pair of condenser mics, and we'll use these for our drum overheads. Additionally, you're going to need one extra mic, like an SM57, and two pairs of headphones. Everything else is just leads and stands. So, we need a pair of jack-to-jack -jack leads to connect the audio interface to the monitors. And then we need eight mic leads. These want to be six meters long and XLR male to female. And then it's just uh, microphone stands. So we need a pair of these slightly more expensive uh, boom stands featuring a center adjustable pole. We'll use these to position our two overhead mics about six or seven feet above the kit, and hence we need that center adjustable pole to raise these two mic stands up quite high. And then we need five regular boom stands without the center adjustable pole. These cost a bit less. And finally, we need a kick drum mic stand. So that's all the gear that we need, and again, anything you own can be knocked off this list saving money. I put this bundle deal together at Tom Man, which is a typical indicator of a good low street price, and all this equipment costs just over a thousand euros or 922 British pounds. And that's pretty good because between four band members that works out at just 250 euros or 230 British pounds each, which is really good value because with this equipment you can make unlimited recordings of your band. Whereas if you paid a local recording studio, you'd probably spend 200 pounds or 200 euros for just one day's recording. So there's all the equipment that we need, and this is pretty much what we used to record the song in this video. Uh, so let's get down the studio and get this recording done. The kick drum mic is normally positioned inside the bass drum, close to the head where the beater hits the drum skin. The snare drum mic is positioned between the first tom and the hi-hat stand, pointing at the snare drum head, close to the rim. The hi-hat mic is positioned pointing at the edge of the hi-hats. Normally I position it pointing slightly away from the kit to help reject the sound of the snare drum. And over here, we can see the snare mic on the snare. The two overhead mics are positioned pointing down at the kit from above. One on the left side of the kit and one on the right side of the kit. If we look at their position from the side, this nearest overhead is positioned so it's angled down pointing at the hanging toms and the furthest overhead is roughly positioned so it's pointing down at the floor tom. Here is the microphone for the guitar amp and as you can see you position it pointing at the speaker cone. Here's the microphone on the bass rig again pointing directly at the speaker cone. And over here we can see the vocal mic. Now you'll notice there are two mics. 
One is feeding the PA so the band can hear the singer as they perform. The second mic is connected to our audio interface to capture a recording of the vocal. OK, so the overhead mics plug into inputs 1 and 2. These will be recorded as a stereo pair. The kick drum mic plugs into input 3. The snare mic plugs into input 4. The hi-hat mic plugs into input 5. The guitar mic plugs into input 6. The bass mic plugs into input 7. And finally, the vocal mic plugs into input 8. Next, in your sequencer software, create seven audio tracks. Make the first track a stereo track, receiving on input 1 and 2, the input for our two overhead mics. Our two overhead mics will be recorded to this stereo track as a stereo pair. All the other tracks are mono. Track number 2 is receiving on input 3, the kick drum mic. Track number 3 is receiving on input 4, the snare drum mic. Track number four is receiving on input five, the hi-hat mic. Track number five is receiving on input six, the guitar mic. Track number six is receiving on input seven, the bass mic. And finally, track number seven is receiving on input eight, the vocal mic. Once you've got all your tracks set and you're ready to record, put all of the tracks into record mode so that when you hit record, each track will record the microphones assigned to it. OK, so now get the band to go through a song while you adjust the input levels for the microphones on the audio interface. As you adjust the input levels for the mics while the band plays, don't rely on the meters on the front of the audio interface. It's best to adjust the microphone input levels while referring to the meters on the record tracks on your audio software. Once everything's set, make a test recording and play it back on headphones and do a final check. And then make any final adjustments to your input levels, turning some of the inputs up or some of them down, depending on whether any particular drum or the guitar or the vocal or whatever is being recorded too quiet or too loud. So once you've made your final tweaks to input levels and any final adjustments to microphone positions, you're ready to go. Put all eight tracks into record and let the band go for it. Alrighty, here is one of the songs that we recorded during that session. Now before I play it to you, I'll just tell you that for the purpose of making this video, I let the band choose the rehearsal room. And unfortunately, the they chose a room with a very, very live ambient sound, which meant that everything had a more distant quality on the mics because there was so much room sound. So this is like the worst case scenario of a recording you'll get from this type of setup, right? But here's the basic uh, recording done at the studio. I haven't mixed it, I've just set the levels and done a couple of tweaks. Um, here's the basic recording. OK, and now here's the same recording with the drums pretty much mixed. I've gone for a very straightforward, clean drum mix here. Nothing fancy, OK. Uh, I'm not going to get into the techniques I used to do this drum mix. We'll save that for a separate video. But the original guitar, bass and vocal tracks recorded in the studio, they've been muted. And here's the drums pretty much mixed in a clean style. Back at home, we set up all the equipment like this. We have our laptop, complete with external USB audio drive. 
if you're using an external USB audio drive. We also have the audio interface connected to the laptop and this is set up in the sequencer software as the preferred audio interface device. The two jack leads are used to connect the audio interface to the two monitors. Plug the leads into the two monitor outputs and then the other end of the leads plug them into the speakers. One on the left and one on the right speaker. We're also going to need a microphone either a dynamic mic such as on the left or a large diaphragm condenser mic such as on the right or one of each. Now all we need is our two pairs of headphones. We connect one pair of headphones to one of the headphone outputs and the other pair of headphones to the other headphone output. This now gives us two headphones to monitor on. One for the performer and the other one for the person operating the software and doing the recording. OK, so these are your three choices for overdubbing new guitar and bass parts onto your drum recordings back at home. Choice number one, we can mic up a guitar or bass amp or combo and record our new guitar or bass parts directly from that. In which case, mic up your guitar amp or combo and then plug the mic lead into one of the inputs on the front of the interface. In this case, I'm using input number one. Next, in our audio sequencer, which has the rehearsal recording project loaded, we create a new mono audio track and set it to receive on that input. In this case, input number one. And then, as the bassist or guitarist plays, adjust the input to get a good signal level for the guitar or bass on that track. Choice number two, if you've got an amp modeling rig or a guitar head with direct outputs, then we can record our new bass or guitar parts directly from that. So if your modeling rig or amp head has a mono output, then take a jack lead from that mono output and plug it into one of the inputs on the front of the audio interface. In this case, I'm gonna use input two. Then, in our audio sequencer, which has the Rehearsal Studio recording project loaded, we create a new mono audio track and set it to receive on that input, in this case, input number two. And then, as the guitarist or bassist plays, adjust the input to get a good signal for the guitar or bass. If your guitar head or amp modeling rig has stereo outputs, then take two jack leads from that pair of stereo outputs and plug them into the first two inputs on the front of the audio interface as a stereo pair. Now, in your audio sequencer, which has the rehearsal recording project loaded, again, we create a new audio track, but this time we make it a stereo audio track and set it to receive on that pair of inputs, in this case, input one and two. And then again, as the guitarist or bassist plays, adjust that pair of input levels until you get a good signal from the guitar or bass. Finally, your third option is the one we went for with our session. Recording the guitar and bass parts direct into amp modeling software hosted in the sequencer, in this case, Logic. So connect your instrument to one of the inputs on the front. In this case, I'm gonna use input two and then switch that input to instrument mode to ensure the input is set correctly for a directly connected guitar or bass. Then in our sequencer software, which has the Rehearsal Studio recording loaded, we create a new audio track with a bass or amp modeling rig on it. In Logic, this is called a guitar or bass track. So you choose either a bass or a guitar amp modeling rig to put onto the track and then ensure the track is receiving on the correct input, in this case, input number two. Finally, we adjust the input as the guitarist or bassist plays to ensure that we're getting the correct input level. To overdub our new vocal recordings, we plug our vocal mic into one of the inputs, in this case, input one. Then we activate phantom power if the mic requires phantom power. Then, in our sequencer software, which has the rehearsal recording project loaded, we create a new mono audio track, receiving on that microphone input, in this case, input one. 
We then adjust the input level for the mic to get a good signal and record our new vocal to this mono audio track. OK, now there's one last thing that we have to do in order to record these fresh overdubs of guitar, bass and vocal over our drums backing. In our audio sequencer audio preferences panel, where we install the audio interface, in this case the M-Track 8, we need to set the in-out buffer sample size for the audio interface to a low setting of either 32 or 64 samples. Then we need to turn the direct monitoring off on our audio interface. For the M-Track 8 to do this you turn the direct mono switch off and then you turn the direct monitor control pot all the way clockwise to USB. So input monitoring has been switched off on our interface and that means if we feed any signal into any of the inputs of the interface then at the outputs of the interface whether it's the speaker or the headphone outs we should not hear that signal passing through the interface from the input. At the output we should hear nothing unless we activate input monitoring on the record track. Now all sequencers, whether it's Logic or Cubase or Pro Tools or whatever, they all feature these input monitor switches on their record tracks. When you activate input monitoring, then the signal feeding into that track, whether it's a guitar, a bass or a vocal or whatever, that signal is allowed to pass through the record track, through the recording software and out of the other side of the audio interface where you can then hear the signal at either the speaker or the headphone output. And because we set the buffer setting for our audio interface to a low sample size of just 32 or 64 samples, that signal passes through the record software and out of the other side of the audio interface with no noticeable delay. And this is the way that the performer can hear themselves as they sing or play to add their overdubs to the backing track. This technique is called through monitoring. And we should always use this technique when we work with a software like Logic or Pro Tools or Cubase, etc., unless we're recording blocks of backing tracks in the studio, in which case this technique isn't required. A certain kind I'll blow on cold Yeah, down my soul, yeah You know I can't explain I'm feeling good now, yeah, but Okay, and here's the song pretty much mixed uh, This is like a rough mix um, We've still got the original guitar, bass and vocal track from Don in the Studio they're muted, we got the newly replaced bass, we double tracked the guitar, so there's two guitars doing the rhythm, and the vocals, well to be honest the vocalist was a bit tired when he came to do the singing, so he had a lot of trouble hitting the pitch, so um, the vocals need doing again, you can think of this as a guide vocal. But here we are with a rough mix. A certain kind 